Great. Well, thank you for those readings, and um, great to be with you here in Del Abbey this afternoon. Um, apologies to those who were watching earlier but couldn't hear anything. Hopefully, you'll be able to hear this nice and clearly. I don't want you to miss what we have for you today from Exodus chapter 28 to 30. Uh, there's so much uh, helpful, um, well, God's word is always helpful to us, isn't it? And when we meet together in the presence of God's spirit, as he indwells us, there's much for us to learn and be shaped by for the week ahead. So let's just lift this time again to the Lord now in prayer. Father, we've just heard the song, The Servant King, and we thank you so much that you saw it fit for us to be served by your one and only Son. That he who flung stars into space to cruel nails was surrendered for us. Father, please guide us by your Spirit now, we pray, to hear and understand your word. Lord, for it to shape our lives, for it to shape our hearts, for it to shape our response to you. And we ask this all that we might give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, In the back of your service sheet, there's a little outline for what I'm going to be saying, and also a diagram of what the high priest's clothes might look like, okay? Because last week we were thinking about homes, and if you remember, we began with the picture of Ikea. I'm not talking to you about who who likes, you know, homemaking, those kind of things. We're moving a bit further down the high street this week from home stores to clothes shopping. Okay, who likes clothes shopping here? Anybody, a few? <laughs> Not many, interesting. I don't normally get embarrassed about much stuff, but I do get embarrassed when I'm clothes shopping. Weirdly, that's all, we're all different, aren't we? Uh, but clothes are useful because they tell us about people. So, um, if my Lydia was wearing this on here, where would she be going? To a party, exactly. She's not going to be dressed like that to go and wash the car, is she? No, well, she might try. (laughs) But yeah, okay. So that's quite exactly if she's going to a party. If you're wearing one of these, like a real size one, what are you going to be doing? What job? Yeah, firefighter. Brilliant, okay. Now, here's a test. What about this one here? Who wears this? Stormtrooper, no. Power Ranger, no. Yeah, come on. (laughs) It's close, it's close to see if John was here. My son, he'd tell you, he'd put you right. This is a clone trooper outfit, which is very similar to a stormtrooper, but slightly different. This one is in fact Commander Cody. There we go. Um, So if you're wearing that, you know, uh, or you see someone wearing that, (laughs) <laughs> You've got to watch out. Although John has walked the dog wearing that costume. <laughs> but what people wear makes a difference to how you react to them, you see. Because if you're out and about and someone wearing a police um, uh, uniform tells you to do something, then you do it, don't you? It, it, it makes a difference what the person is wearing. And today we're going to see how what the high priest wears makes a difference to their role and shines a massive light on the Lord Jesus for us. Because in Exodus chapter 28 to 30, we move from a description of the tabernacle, which we were thinking about last week, to a description of what the priest wears and how they are to act. Okay? And if you remember the context, we're at the foot of Mount Sinai still. The Israelites have been freed from Egypt, they've crossed the Red Sea, gone a little bit through the desert to Mount Sinai, where God's met with them, He's given them the law given them the covenant, and then explain to them the dimensions of how to make this tabernacle, where he will symbolically dwell with them, but with a great big no entry sign, the curtain. Do you remember that from, from last week? And I really, my, my hope and prayer as we go through this book of Exodus is that we don't just see this as Old Testament history, but actually that, that we see it as a real rich portrait of who the Lord Jesus is and what he's done for us. You see, the New Testament didn't just happen. It builds on this legacy of thousands of years of God working through real people in real history, which adds to the massive authenticity of the Bible story. So, 
the priest's wardrobe is what we're thinking about today. And like I say, we're looking at three chapters of Exodus here, so we're going to be um, kind of scooting through them at, at quite a pace. I'm going to be referring to different verses, some we've had read, lots that we haven't. So Exodus chapter 28, verse 2, says this, Make, make sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honour. And then verse 4, these are the garments they are to make. A breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a woven tunic, a turban and a sash. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his sons, so they may serve me as priests. Have them use gold and blue, purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen. So we're going to have a little look at some of these garments first one is an ephod. It's on your picture, um, on your service sheet. An ephod appears to be a kind of tabard, a bit like a training bib worn by a sports person as they're warming up perhaps, but much more elaborate of course. The Israelites are to inscribe the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on two stones. They have six on each and to place them on the shoulders of the ephod. The reason is tells you in verse 12 of Exodus 28, it allows the priest to bear the names of God's people on his shoulders as a memorial before the Lord. That's the ephod. Next we have the breast piece described in verses 15 to 16. And this is tied to the front of the priest over the ephod. You can read more details again in verses 22 to 28. Sewn into it are 12 precious stones in four rows of three. And again, the 12 stones represent the 12 tribes of Israel. So verse 21, uh, sorry, verse 29 of Exodus 28 tells us, whenever Aaron enters the holy place, he will bear the names of the sons of Israel over his heart on the breastpiece of decision as a continuing memorial before the Lord. And this breastpiece of decision is literally the, the breastpiece of judgment is probably a reference to something called the Urim and the Thummim, which you might have heard about or you might not have done. Don't worry, either way. Uh, the Urim and the Thummim were kept in the breast piece. We don't know exactly what they were or how they worked, but they helped in making decisions. The important thing for us is that the names of God's people are both on the shoulders and over the hearts of the priest, because the priest represents the people. It's as if the priest carries the people into the presence of God. Okay? That's why those two details are important. The priest carries the people into the presence of God. And that's a really helpful visual aid for us. The Israelites actually saw it when the priest went in to the Holy of Holies, didn't it? We've got to imagine it. But then we get the priestly robe described later in uh, chapter 28, verses 31 to 35. It is hemmed with pomegranates, of all things, Brilliantly creative fruit, have you seen a pomegranate? Kind of talks of the creativity and beauty and provision of Eden that we were thinking of last week. But the robe is also hemmed with bells. And in verse 35, the priest needs bells so that he will not die. The bells let God know that it is the priest entering, not someone else. Because if it's someone else, God will break out against them. Of course, this is symbolic. God doesn't need bells to distinguish between people. In truth, the bells are for the people, not for the Lord. An audible reminder that sinners cannot come before God without a mediator. Then later in chapter 28, we get other items uh, described, like the turban, which has a plaque on the top saying, Holy to the Lord. And then uh, we see uh, a tunic and a sash and other things described. All of these give dignity and honour to the priest. And lastly, in chapter 28, underwear is described in verse 42. The priests must wear underwear from the waist to the thigh so that they will not incur guilt. That's in verse 43. And I don't know if that reminds you of a perhaps slightly awkward reading from a few weeks ago in Exodus chapter 20 where we read that the Israelites were to make altars without steps. Do you remember that? Because going up steps in a priestly robe might expose your private parts. Hmm, why have I brought that up again? Well, it's potentially embarrassing, isn't it? 
And you might be imagining the embarrassment of a priest whose private parts might be exposed. But that's the point. It is embarrassing. You see, back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, uh, they were both naked in the garden, weren't they? And they felt no shame in Exodus chapter 2. But the very first thing that happens when they reject God is they realise they are naked. And so they try to cover themselves in Genesis chapter 3. Our embarrassment is a sign that we still feel that shame. It's a sign that deep down we know we're guilty. And so it points to our need of a priest to come before God on our behalf. Then we get to Exodus chapter 29, which talks about consecrating the priests. Because we need a priest to come before God on our heart. Oh dear, put my teeth in. We need a priest to come before God on our behalf. But friends, the problem is, all of our priests are guilty too, aren't they? They're all guilty because they're people. In Exodus chapter 29, God describes how Moses is to consecrate the priests through ceremonial washing and through sacrifice. And if you remember from the last couple of weeks, the word consecrate means to to, to make holy or to, to be separate, to be set apart. So in chapter 29, in verse 4, the priests are to be washed as a symbolic act of cleansing from sin. A bit like our baptism, but more on that another time. And in chapter 30, we're given the details of the basin that's required for the washing. Later in chapter 29, the priests are to be anointed. And then in chapter 30, we're given the details of the oil required for this. The priests are to be dressed in their priestly robes and anointed with oil as a sign that they act not in their own right, but as consecrated as priests. And then the priests symbolically transfer their sin onto an animal that dies in their place. They're to sacrifice a bull and two rams, and we're given all the details of of what they do with the insides and all sorts in verses 10 to 28 of chapter 29. In each case, Aaron and his sons are to lay their hands on the animal. That symbolic transference of their sin. It's as if their sin passes to the animal and then the animal dies, bearing the penalty of their sin. Because sin is rectified by death. And in verses 20 to 21, blood from one of the offerings is placed on their ears, their fingers and their toes. And there, he and his sons and their garments will be consecrated. Before the priest can represent the people and atone for the people's sin, his own sin must be atoned for. And this is done through the blood and through the washing. And at the end of the process, we read in verses 31 to 33 that they eat a meal in the presence of God. Ah, remember we said last week that kind of like eating with the Lord is like the goal of our salvation. That's a picture of our heavenly home. We saw it a few weeks back at the foot of Mount Sinai where Moses and uh, uh, Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders ate at the foot of the mountain in God's presence because all the conditions were met, all those brilliant things. It's great, isn't it? They eat a meal in the presence of God. And uh, on your handout, there's a little kind of diagram showing the kind of direction of travel with things. You notice the flow or the movement. The people's guilt is transferred to the priests. They carry it on their chest and on their shoulders. The priest's guilt is then, and the people's guilt is transferred to the animals. The animals die. Sin, as it were, reaches the dead end. And then... This is really interesting. Chapter 29, verse 37 says this. For seven days make atonement for the altar and consecrate it. Then the altar will be most holy, and whoever touches it will be holy. Sin is dealt with, and so holiness can flow back in the other direction. And then, just briefly picking up on one more detail from Exodus chapter 30. And it's all about atonement money. Because in verses 11 to 16 of chapter 30, we read the instructions for how each Israelite must pay the Lord a ransom for his life. It's described as atonement money, and it involved the people queuing up to enrol in a census. And it's a payment that had to be made each time they had this census, which I think kind of shows it's it's a debt that can never be fully repaid. They have to pay it every time. 
And look what this all achieves. This is a lovely summary at the end of Exodus chapter 29, verses 44 to 46. God says this, So I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar, and I will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Because of all that happens, God says he will dwell among the Israelites. A great picture of being with God that we look forward to in the new heaven and the new earth, just as Adam and Eve enjoyed before the fall back in Eden. But remember, with the tabernacle, there's still the no entry sign with the curtain. There's still all this blood that needs to be shed on a daily basis to enable any kind of access. So let's bring it now to Hebrews 9, where we have that wonderful reading from Ali. Because Hebrews 9 tells us that Jesus is our tabernacle, he's our priest, and he's our sacrifice. As New Testament believers, as I've said in previous weeks, we look at the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. And the book of Hebrews is so helpful in this regard. Hebrews tells us that Jesus has come as our high priest. He's unlike any high priest before him because, as we heard, chapter 9 verse 12 says, Christ did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, so obtaining eternal redemption. Jesus offered a sacrifice, and that sacrifice was himself. So we didn't have this read, but in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, it says, Christ has appeared once for all at the, at the culmination of the angels to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And through that sacrifice, he comes before God in heaven as our high priest. These are wonderful images. And not just a kind of high priest picture, not just a tabernacle picture, not just a sacrifice, but all together, they work to show us what the Lord Jesus has done. Like it's kind of like layer upon layer upon layer of evidence for the authenticity of Christ and his work. So as we draw things together today, apologies that it's quite fast pace, but I hope it helps you see more of the Lord who we remembered on Thursday has risen to heaven. It was Ascension Day on Thursday, wasn't it? And we remember Jesus now sitting at God's right hand, reigning. That is our high priest. That is our tabernacle. That is our sacrifice who's seated with God at the right hand now. And he is for us because he loves us. He did all of this acting as our high priest, being our mediator between us and God because he loves us. He loves you. So if you're sitting here today feeling really riddled by guilt, know that Jesus has won your forgiveness because he has acted as your high priest. It is done. And so we can be freed from guilt. And we live our lives in response to that wonderful work that the Lord Jesus has done. And like I said a couple of weeks ago, if you leave here today, marvelling more at the Lord Jesus and how the whole Bible story fits together. That is a good and healthy thing for us. And if you're not a Christian today, either watching or here with us this afternoon, the challenge is how are you going to atone for your sin if you don't have Jesus as your high priest? The Bible says there's no other way. And then just as a bit of a an aside for a moment. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be welcoming James Lee and his family to the benefits. Uh, and James is going to be ordained as a deacon at the cathedral, and then, God willing, next year will be ordained as a priest. Just as I was ordained as a priest back in uh, 2016. So what does that mean? Well, we could quite easily misunderstand the role of a priest if we just take the cues from Exodus chapter 28 to 30. Because in Exodus 28 30, the priest represented the people before God and the priest drew the people into God's presence and the priest acted as a mediator. Some people misunderstand the role that I do as still having that function. But I am not your mediator. 
Jesus Christ is our mediator between man and God. Go to him. Don't come to me. If I'm doing my job, I am pointing you to him. Okay? Uh, also, uh, some people see the view as, as, as of a priest as someone who will almost offer a re-sacrifice, especially when we come to, to communion, just like the Old Testament priests did. But again, Jesus is our high priest. He has offered himself once and for all. When we take communion, we give thanks for that. And there is blessing in partaking in the bread and the wine, but we're not re-sacrificing. And also as New Testament believers, all of us united are a holy priesthood, a royal nation, a people belonging to God. Now it is important that we recognise uh, leaders in our churches and that we give them time uh, set aside and um, you know, honour and, and respect and, and that's fine and, and that, we, that we pray for our leaders but we must understand the role of priest or the better word is presbyter really as those who work under so I'm an under shepherd under the shepherd the Lord Jesus so I hope that helps a little bit just to <laughs> think about the role of priest these days. Um, like I said, I know I've gone quite quick, so if you've got any questions or would like to talk about any of this um, afterwards, I'd be really happy to. What I'm going to do, I'll draw our sermon together. I'm going to read these words from Hebrews 10 that I read last week, um, and we'll use them as a prayer as well. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another daily. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen.